All right, everyone, welcome to Will and Amla Live. Again, Amla is not here, so it's just Will, but we do have a very special guest on the show, Natalie Winters, who is a reporter for The National Pulse. The National Pulse is a website, news organization, that actually just recently I've been really getting into, reading all their articles, checking it every morning for the latest scoop on what's going on. Before we get into that, uh, guys, remember, you can go on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play. You can get Will and Amla Live on there. You can rate it five stars. You can download the podcast. And it's it's been amazing to see how many of you guys have been actually going on there listening to it every day downloading it it mean it means the world that you guys are supporting the show that way remember if you're here on youtube or facebook like the video comment down below your thoughts and share it with your friends so anyway natalie it's great to have you here thank you so much for having me and so people probably they, they might have seen your articles or might have seen you on war room i was listening to war room steve bannon's show this was a couple of months ago and they said oh we're bringing natalie winters on and I was like, is this the same Natalie Winters that I knew like four years ago from Prager Force? And then I heard you and I was shocked. And I was like, it is the same Natalie Winters. So tell people a little bit about who you are and, and how you got to this position. Sure. A lot has changed, I, I think, since we last spoke. But uh, for people who don't know, when I was in high school, so believe it or not, I am from Los Angeles, um, but somehow I managed to make it out as conservative. I was very involved in Prager Force. I was part of the student ambassador program. I remember I've been to your offices, your headquarters several times. I participated in a bunch of events, got to meet some really, really amazing people, yourself included, through the program. And I, I really attribute um, a lot of the, I would say, success that I've had in the realm of journalism to my, my early days back when I was affiliated with PragerU um, in the sense that the videos that I watched really helped me gain, I think, a theoretical and really, I mean, philosophical understanding of a lot of the values that undergird uh, my conservative beliefs, because I'm sure as anyone who's, who's listening right now knows, you don't really get that uh, in today's version of academia, though it's, it's barely that. Um, but PragerU, I think, was really a, a formative experience, experience for me. I know I met a lot of people who I still talk to today, but um, I, I'm still actually a college student, so I'm finishing up at the University of Chicago. I have about a year left, but concurrently, while being a student, which I'm sure many people know, especially with COVID-19, it's not that hard to, to do your classes since it's all remote anyways. Um, I've worked as an investigative reporter for an outlet called The National Pulse, focusing primarily on how the Chinese Communist Party really infiltrates and just gets their evil, evil hands uh, into every aspect and every corner of American society, from academia to media, uh, even to our politicians. Um, and through that, I've been fortunate to go on a lot of different shows, like you mentioned, War Room, I frequent. Um, but I really try to focus on just this corruption that I think one sees every single day, very blatantly going on in Washington, D.C., all through the Beltway, all across this country. And my thesis, my theory of the case is that the Chinese Communist Party is responsible for a lot of it. Amen to that. Yeah, we, I was looking at, I sent this to you the other day, I was looking at old pictures from like five years ago when I was still in college and you, I guess you were in high school still. And I was like, wow, mm -hmm. like how far we've come <laughs> since then. I know I, I look much better back then. I've gotten fat now too. So it, it's all gone worse. But it, getting it, I mean, to be an investigative journalist while you're still in college and especially to the, gr the degree that you're doing it, I mean, these are massive geopolitical issues that take a lot of research. It's not just something where you see a Twitter headline and write something up about it on your website. Like this is, this is a big deal. If you, especially if you guys watching have seen any of the articles that she's done or National Pulse has done, like these are, these are real investigative things. How did you get into to being someone accomplishing that and not just another kind of run of the mill type of, you know, college journalist. Yeah, well, I think part of it was my kind of personal aversion to what journalism has become today. And I don't just mean the typical critique that you hear that journalism is all about, you know, just fitting an agenda, pushing an agenda, trying to make a narrative. But I think especially on the conservative side of media, there are a lot of people who go into politics, go into media with the intent to, you know, write op-eds and share their opinions and their feelings. And for me, I just didn't really like that style of journalism because I think there was just such a wide open, for lack of a better word, market for true investigative reporting. And I'm sure we'll get into all the ways uh, that Beijing has compromised a lot of America's top, although I use that word lightly, uh, top journalists. So I was very fortunate, although much to, I would say, the, the detriment of the country, 
uh, that there really, really was a wide open field for journalists who wanted to focus on the Chinese Communist Party and how they really exploit and subvert all aspects of America, all the way from kindergarten classrooms to college classrooms to, you know, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, so that was how I, I really got into it, because like I said, no one else was doing it. And I've been fortunate to have worked for a War Room, which is Steve Bannon's podcast before I ever started doing media publicly. And just through listening to his show and really being an adherent to his worldview. And I'll even say I, I grew up listening to uh, Dennis Prager's radio show. Um, I, I think I was blessed to really understand the critical point that we are at right now in terms of Western civilization and really the, the future of the West. And I think so many of these questions related to civil liberties, freedom, heck, even the ability to just, you know, go outside your house and go to the supermarket if you don't have 18 vaccines and 12 boosters. Um, a lot of this debate, this dilemma, these, I think, this fundamental erosion of the, the freedoms that, you know, I've grown up and I'm very fortunate to have, but we're kind of seeing slip away right now. I think that there's really, really a close relationship between that development, that trend, um, and the Chinese Communist Party's continued rise and ascension um, on the global stage. So that was why I thought it was worthy of focusing on, and I'm very glad that I did. I find anyone who listened to Dennis Prager as a kid always does well <laughs> in their life. Dennis Prager's pro war tip, room. Pro tip, yes. Yeah, pro <laughs> tip. If you have kids, make them listen to Dennis Prager's Happiness Hour. It'll change their life. But, I mean, you bring up an interesting point. I think you're exactly right. I see this with the conservative space, the conservative news space, or even the you know Republican uh, political stuff with – it's so much about just making a name for yourself or writing what's easy and not actually going out there and doing digging and finding the truth. You know, I put out a post uh, just a couple of days ago that I had you review actually about China and the Beijing Olympics and how America should boycott these Olympics. And I've been hearing this from some people, but I'm hearing from a lot of other conservative voices. I mean, they won't even touch this kind of stuff, right? They won't come out and talk about it or, you know, say anything bad about China. Whereas like people like you and, and others are, are saying what is actually going on. So when it comes to something like the Beijing Olympics, Olympics. What are your thoughts on it? Cancel them. Um, but Amen. if you can't do that, which frankly, we probably won't because the entire world is under the thumb of the Chinese Communist yeah. Party. And so we're 22 days sponsors. away. Yeah, right. Um, America definitely shouldn't go. Um, but, you know, I think that what's going on right now with the Olympics is a perfect example of how really every aspect of the West, you know, you can make it America specific, but I think it's it's a broader, to use a term of the left, systemic problem that, you know, you see going on here. Um, but it's it's a perfect example of what I, I kind of focus on in my reporting. Um, people may have seen, uh, there, was a, there was an article a few days ago where one of the corporate sponsors of the Olympics, I, I forget the company's name, I hadn't heard of them, um, but they were reached out to comment. And they said by actually someone who I believe had survived the Xinjiang concentration camps, they run a human rights organization. And they asked them, they said, why are you comfortable sponsoring the Olympics? And uh, whether it was a PR blunder or frankly, I think it was telling of, of where these companies' intentions lie, they actually said a direct quote that they were proud to be sponsoring the Olympics. So not only the fact that you have all these corporate sponsors of, of the Olympics, but you are really right. There is, there seems to be a total silence. You know, there's an op-ed every now and then, um, but from, from the media. And remember, all these corporate media outlets, all these woke left-wing politicians who preach tolerance, tolerance, although we know tolerance is code for, well, only if, you know, I agree with you. Right. Um, these are the people who are, you know, cheerleading and aiding and abetting one of the most, if not the most, brutal and repressive regime on the history, in the history of the world currently, right now, um, to be hosting an event uh, that they shouldn't be hosting in the first place with regard to how they handled COVID-19 um, and, you know, how they... Um, uh, really tried to hide and, and obscure the origins of this virus through the various probes that we've been been seeing going on to try to get to the bottom of this virus. But unfortunately, um, you know, no one, at least no one with power, really has the, the appetite or the urge to hold the Chinese Communist Party to account. That's why we still haven't gotten to the bottom of the origins of COVID-19. Frankly, I'm skeptical if, if we ever will, but it's a, it's a perfect example of how when no one in power is willing to actually engage with the Chinese Communist Party, the best we can get is maybe a few diplomats don't go uh, to the Olympics. But it's, I mean, it's wild that, you know, a couple of years after COVID-19, we're going to be sending 
uh, athletes to a country that likely unleash this pandemic, they'll be experiencing the economic boom and just the you know power boom, right? It's a regime that craves authority and looking powerful and looking important. And what better way to do that than let them host the Olympics? No, I mean, they, they, they have said straight up that they want world domination. I mean, that is their plan. <laughs> they, they have said this. And the fact that we're sending these athletes there to go and compete just to me seems like it's a clear callback to the 1936 games where athletes, there were boycott movements all over the world, but still all these countries sent athletes to Germany. Germany was bolstered by people going in and saying, Hey, look at Germany. Look how great we're doing. You know, the Nazis were awesome. And right after the Olympics ended, then Germany goes, the Hitler and the Nazis invaded Czechoslovakia. Austria, Poland, they felt emboldened because they knew that these other countries would bend the knee to them. And that's what it feels like with China now, that if people are going to say, hey, China, what you're doing is OK, we're going to send athletes to you and all this corporate press and all these these this these billions of, of dollars from uh, corporations. That means it's OK. I hear a lot of people. I, I put this article out and I have people talking about, well, you know, America just needs to go over there and they need to kick their butt when it comes to the sports. You know, let's get some some gold medals and skiing and sledding and show them that America is strong. For me, that argument doesn't hold up because I don't think that the cost outweighs the, the benefit from actually going and doing that. Uh, what do you think about that when it comes to the, is going there and winning a bunch of gold medals for America? Is that enough of a slap in the face to China to justify going to these games? Certainly not. Um, you know, I think you really hit the nail on the head in that not going to the Olympics is is not just about standing up to the human rights abuses that we see going on, right? That's obviously the tip of a very, very large large iceberg when it comes to the Chinese Communist Party's, you know, sins and crimes against humanity. Um, but there's a bigger, more systemic problem that no number of gold medals is going to fix, and that is that the Chinese Communist Party fundamentally seeks to override and really overrule America in terms of kind of the global world order. And they, they admit it. I think the Chinese Communist Party is, is probably the only enemy of America that when they tell us what their intentions are, our media establishment and our politicians don't take them at face value. They try to euphemize what they're saying. Um, when in reality, if you read Chinese state-run media, which I'm, I'm blessed to do every day uh, and watch all their TV shows, you know, every other day they're demanding a military buildup. They're saying, this is the day we're going to take over Taiwan. You know, every day as the Olympics get closer, I don't see any tempering of the Chinese Communist Party's aggression. And frankly, I think what they what, what they see going on in Afghanistan, what they see going on in America's southern border, all this crisis going on, they're going to have a moment of calm, a moment where the spotlight is all on them with the with the Olympics. And I'm, I'm sure I, I would I know if I bet a lot of money, but I, I definitely would wager that that after the Olympics, I think they will move on Taiwan. I think they'll feel very, very emboldened um, because, frankly, you know, what what is their takeaway? They get to, attack, you know, release a global pandemic that totally fundamentally rearranges the global economy to benefit the, China, the Chinese Communist Party, um, destroy our financial system, destroy our way of life, um, really, I mean, strip away our civil liberties. Um, and a couple of years after that, they get to host, you know, the world's top sporting game. That to me is we can do whatever we want. We're the Chinese Communist Party and we can get away with it because America is too busy, you know, debating over inflation um, and certain spending packages and, you know, what genders we should be calling our children, um, which is, of course, I would argue another thing, you know, this whole kind of woke movement that we've seen that's really right. into the Chinese Communist Party. But no, no number of gold medals, you know, that's playing by their rules, that's fitting into a paradigm where, again, the Chinese Communist Party, you know, I'm sure those medals will be made in China. Um, right. You don't want those. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're going to be made out of those little chocolate ones, probably. <laughs> Not even real gold. With COVID, probably. Yeah, but I, th I think you're right. And and thinking about Taiwan, I mean, if they're going to invade Taiwan, that seems like a definite possibility. And it also goes even deeper than that. I mean, what about India, India and, and China? You know, they're feeling more and more emboldened to do even more than what I think a lot of people are suspecting that they will do. I think especially when China's getting pushed into a corner. I mean, they have a population that is, you know, they had 400 million abortions because of their one child policy. They have a very old population. It seems like for China, uh, especially with their inflation, I mean, that they're seeing their, their economy's wild right now. I, I think that they are really coming to a tipping point where they kind of have to make the decision and say, it's either time to act and do this and, and make the, you know, get this world domination that we want or to just 
go away. What do you think is the next plan for their country when it comes to that? Well, I think they're definitely, and by they, I mean, you know, Beijing and then people within the Chinese Communist Party, because it is difficult, right? Not everyone who lives in China is a member of the Chinese Communist Party. Right. And they're the biggest victims, as we well know, of, of this brutal regime. Um, but I, I definitely think that, you know, they've been very straightforward with what their intentions are, whether that's through launching programs like the Belt and Road Initiative, Made in China 2025, which we're getting a lot closer to, right? That's just three years away now. Um, they've made it clear the writing is on the wall. They want to be the global superpower. I don't really even think that they want a, a bipolar state of, of affairs in the sense that, you know, it's the United States rules in tandem with China. They want to be top dog. They don't want the United States to be in power anymore. Um, and, and I think that after the Olympics, like I said, I think that is potentially when they will invade Taiwan, because I think that that's kind of the convergence, um, not just of you know, America and the economic situation we have at home um, being really, really, really bad and getting even worse. Um, and yes, Ch China does too, but they have a bit of a different situation because they have such a heavily state-run media. Um, and just in, in general, it's harder to criticize the Chinese Communist Party uh, than it is, the, even though it's not super open debate that we have here in the media. You know, people are more aware, I think, of what's going on here when it comes to the economy. Um, but I, I think that China will strike while the iron is hot. And I think coming off of the Olympics, um, especially as, you know, Omicron rages. Um, and like I said, America just seems to be facing all these internal problems. You know, they I think, believe me, I think China watched what happened in Afghanistan with a very, very watchful eye and a very curious eye um, in the sense that they realized, you know, that. America on the global stage right now uh, is not the America that it used to be. Um, and with that, um, I think that they they know and they've known for a long time that they could probably get away with invading Taiwan. But as you were mentioning, Germany and Czechoslovakia, like history will repeat itself. And I, I think that the Chinese Communist Party, um, as evil as they are, they are students of history. They know that very well. Um, believe me, they know Afghanistan is the graveyard of empires, and I'm sure they love nothing more than watching, you know, America waste blood, treasure, and soil there for so many years. Um, so I, I think that that they will will move. And again, and it's not it's not just you know a, a scary prospect for Americans. You know, people may be wondering, oh, why why should I care about Taiwan? You should if you enjoy using your iPhone. You should if you enjoy using anything that uses you know any of these chips that that we so desperately need for technology. But that entire region, you know, you, you mentioned India is very important. Um, it's it's just very 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 messy. Um, and unfortunately, there's not a lot of clear cut reporting on, you know, what China's doing. We've covered it, but, you know, they're they're playing with some really dangerous stuff. They're manipulating weather. They use microwave radiation against troops in India. You know, they have some really, really scary technological yeah. advances. Meanwhile, you know, our American military is focusing on pronouns and, and reading Mao. Um, but it's a really scary prospect that I think people don't quite understand. Yeah, you mentioned there. That was important about reporting on what's happening in China. And there is uh, there's basically no one who's actually reporting the truth on China in the mainstream media in America today. And that's because the mainstream media is controlled in many ways by the CCP. The CCP has as a level of dominion over American media. Can you talk a little bit more about that and explain the examples that people probably have no idea are happening? Yes. So this is probably my favorite topic to talk about. So thank you for wow. asking me. Yeah, so go ahead. I know <laughs> very niche. Uh -huh. um, but so this is a story that I've talked about a lot because I think it's very, very important. So uh, I believe it was in December of last year, I guess two years ago now, uh, we put out, it was probably my first major exclusive story. And it had to do with exactly that, how uh, you know, mainstream media talking points, much like a lot of things in America are also made in China. Um, and what I uncovered through what is called the Foreign Agent Registration Act. So this is a database that's housed at the Department of Justice. So these are you know, legal documents where any company, any entity that is American that is working on behalf of a foreign corporation, a foreign country, a foreign individual has to register. They have to file um, so they can specify the kind of work that they're doing for this foreign company, for this foreign individual. Um, and I found that since 2010, um, there's a lobbying firm by the name of BLJ, uh, Brown Lloyd James, um, and they have been essentially hooking up 
Chinese um, Communist Party influence groups. The premier one is known as the China United States Exchange Foundation with American journalists. So what they've been doing, like I said, since 2010, they've been paying to take journalists from every single top um, outlet in the United States. Um, I could read you all the list of all, all the, the outlets that are participating, but it might take a little long. Uh, but it's MSNBC, Washington Post, New York Times, even the two co-founders of Vox, Matthew Iglesias and Ezra Klein, have participated in these trips. Um, but this foreign influence group that is funded, controlled, bankrolled by the Chinese Communist Party has been paying to take American journalists on trips overseas to China, where they they take countrywide tours, they visit military facilities, they get lectured by Chinese state-run professors, and that in and of itself on face value sounds bad. Um, but when I really started digging into these Foreign Agent Registration Act filings, I saw that upon return, so when these people came back to the United States, they were actually obliged, they were contractually obliged to provide, quote, favorable coverage to the Chinese Communist Party. And another quote that they had in these filings that they were compelled to give was, quote, disseminate positive messages about China, but more precisely, the Chinese Communist Party. And if you keep reading these filings, you can see that they admit to this lobbying firm influencing at least three articles within kind of the mainstream media echo chamber um, per week. That's per, per week. And right. A lot of the names of these journalists who have participated in these programs, um, they've been deleted from the China United States Exchange Foundation's website. As you can imagine, it's you know the same reason that Antifa wears masks. They don't want you to know what they're doing. But luckily, um, I uncovered through looking at different archived versions of websites, the identities of a lot of these people. And so I was curious and I dug into the kind of work and articles that they were publishing, especially around the time that they were taking these trips to China. Uh, and my personal favorite, there's one individual uh, who upon return, I think it was about the month in which she returned to the United States from visiting China, she wrote an article and it was entitled, China bashing is for losers. Um, so this nice. kind of tells you <laughs> about this. We're subversion. losers, Natalie. We are losers. I, I know. I'm, I'm the biggest loser that I've yeah. uh -huh. um, But there are many examples like that. Um, and like I said, that's just one. There are over 250 active, 50 active Chinese foreign agents um, in the United States right now. And those are only the ones that are reported. Remember, you know, certain people who've done a lot of work with China never actually register. Um, so, yeah, so it's, it's very dark. <laughs> and, and so these... What you're saying is that these journalists and these news organizations are paid by the CCP to write favorable things about them. That's ex pretty much what you're saying. That's a direct quote. And like I said, this is just, you know, one example um, from even just from kind of the entertainment perspective, Discovery Channel, which people may know, I, I know I grew up watching. Yeah. Uh, they actually produced a TV show. It had to do it was called I think it was like a day living in China. Uh, exploring the socialist countryside. And they actually produced the show. It was a game show. And if you read about, about the show and how they produced it, it was uh, done, quote, under the direct supervision of this Chinese, you know, state-run state run film agency. And even CBS, we put up a story not too long ago, uh, you know, CBS, which you think is, you know, yeah, it's a mainstream media outlet, but, you know, they're not going to be pushing, you know, Beijing propaganda. Uh, but you'd be wrong to even think that they partnered with another state run Chinese broadcaster where they actually aired these documentaries that were very, very favorable to the Chinese Communist Party. One of them actually spoke about the Cultural Revolution. That is the Cultural Revolution yeah. that killed millions um, in a very positive light as something that I think we should you know, have happen here in the United States. Um, and, and real quick, just because I, I know too much, yeah. <laughs> but um, <laughs> believe it or not, the, the New York Times and CNN, they actually fund China's premier journalism school, which is hosted at Sinhua University. Um, yes, the same university that has hacked the United States government, um, that has been accused of spying on the United States government. But they have what's called a, quote, Marxist journalism school. In the dean's letter about the school, they admit to being overtly Marxist and wanting to create Marxist journalists. Well, they enjoy backing and internships. Um, from some of America's top news outlets, I think I left Bloomberg off that list. So there mm -hmm. really, really is a close relationship um, between a lot of these American media outlets and the Chinese Communist Party, and more precisely, these Chinese state-run media outlets. A lot of CNN people, um, once they either get fired 
or uh, resign. So maybe Chris Cuomo will have a future there. But they've actually gone to work at state run media outlets like China Global Television Network. So it's it's a very, very murky ecosystem. Oh, Jeffrey Tuba needs to learn Mandarin. <laughs> yeah. That's something we all want to see, huh? No, but I don't think I, I, I don't think people understand how big of a deal this is, how important it is, the things that you are saying right now, because these are the institutions in America that are supposed to be trusted as the means to disseminate information to all of us so that we can understand what's going on. Right. So when we talk about the mainstream media, you know, Trump talked about fake news or whoever talks about fake news and we say, you know, oh, it's just kind of woke leftist nonsense. It definitely is that. But when you then look at this and see the control that China has over it, the CCP has over it, it's more than just that. Right. Because it is an infiltration into our media to control us and make us into a weak country. You know, let's let's jump a little bit and go to TikTok. I mean, this is something that that I've been seeing is just I mean, to me, it seems like a destruction of of the youth in this country. The things that are on TikTok, the things that are heralded as good on the platform, the things that go viral. I mean, it's it's women doing pretty vulgar things in a lot of ways. It is a, a destruction of American culture. Yet, if you go and look at Chinese TikTok, they don't allow any of that stuff on TikTok. Right. It's like hardworking people and and things that are pro government. And it's like it feels to me like just like with the mainstream media, that something like TikTok is an infiltration strategy by the CCP to make America into a weak population that is divided. Definitely. You know, it was Sun Tzu who said the supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. And I think that's exactly what you're seeing going on, because part of the critique that I think you could see of the Chinese Communist Party and their relationship with, you know, their big tech platforms like TikTok, the mainstream media, is that they're just exploiting these platforms to shape the discourse and the dialogue about China to be one of, oh, well, you know, China's great. What they're doing to the Uyghurs isn't actually that bad. But I think the more nuanced critique, which you're getting at, and frankly, I think is more important because it has more relevance to our lives as Americans, is how they're shaping the conversations about things like social issues, things like even, you know, gender. I see a lot of articles on TikTok about how people are like, TikTok helped me realize that I was gay. TikTok helped me realize that I was bisexual. (laughs) I don't think Uh, they have any of that on uh, (laughs) Chinese TikTok. No, none. Um, Right, exactly. So, you know, and, and this kind of intersects too, that group I brought up, the China United States Exchange Foundation, you know, and also I will say a lot of this when it gets to how the Chinese Communist Party subverts the American culture war by design, they make it very hard to piece together. Right. They leave little breadcrumbs, but it's very hard to really track down China's influence. But right. what was really interesting to me, there's a group called the National Urban League. Um, and this was one of the foremost groups that sued the Trump administration Um, when they were putting out their ban on critical race theory teaching in the federal government for contractors. Um, And I thought it was curious as to why it would be that group. I'm sure there was some reason. And I actually dug into this group's background. And again, for over 10 years, they've been collaborating with the China United States Exchange Foundation. All of their executives have taken these same kind of pay-for-play trips to China, um, like I said, for over a decade. This is the same group that's now actively trying to uh, impede bans on critical race theory. And what's really interesting is that the National Urban League was also instrumental, absolutely instrumental um, in allowing the first ever Confucius Institutes to be built on college campuses. And for people who don't know what Confucius Institutes are, very, very briefly, they're these Chinese state funded, state run propaganda centers uh, that spew Beijing's line when it comes to China. But that's just a very malign influence on cultural uh, values and on American campuses. But they have been to some extent kind of locked out now. They've been kicked off campus. Um, But I think it's very curious that you see the same group that is spearheading, you know, Confucius Institutes uh, joining and, and being placed on American campuses is now defending critical race theory. And and this gets into, you know, you guys talk a lot about academia and the biases that you see going on there. Um, but the China United States Exchange Foundation, they also sponsor trips to China for students. Um, and one little anecdote that, that really struck me. So in 2017, they actually partnered with, believe it or not, the people who love to tell you that you are racist because, you know, you're not woke to the nines, the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, they partnered with the China United States Exchange Foundation to send students from their districts 
on these basically they're called familiarization trips um, in China. And they would actually meet with they being students as young as, you know, 11 and 10 would be meeting with Chinese military officials, Chinese state run think tanks, all these horrible, horrible, horrible people. Um, and upon return, they were forced to write testimonials about what they experienced. Um, and there's one individual, and I'll, I'll read the quote because I think I think it's worth reading because I think this really co conveys the gravity of the situation. But so this is a high school student who participated in a QSEF, that's the acronym China United States Exchange Foundation, trip to China. Um, and she said, I learned that the culture and history of China far exceeds those of the United States, exceeds it so well, it's predicted that China will be the number one country of foreign policy and investments in less than 20 years. Open your eyes and your mind, research for yourself, and don't be corrupted by the misinterpretation the classrooms feed us. God knew that I needed to participate in this program. He saw me fit to be one of the 20 students that helped spread the positive light of an amazing communist country, as well as help bridge that gap between the China and U.S. cultural exchanges. So this is the kind of misinformation, and I use that word in its truest intention, not the way the left likes to co-opt it. Um, that is being filled in the brains of these young students, but all the way up to the top anchors on these primetime news shows. So this is the kind of cultural war that we're seeing being waged. Um, and no one really wants to talk about how the Chinese Communist Party is, is so directly responsible for so much of it. Right. They know they can get away with it because they know that when mm -hmm. you influence children, then, you know, people aren't really going to ask questions so much. But you, when you try, it's mm -hmm. like when the, you have these teachers in America, these left wing teachers who teach all their kids about gender theory and this LGBT nonsense, that kind of stuff. And it's like, yeah, they have to convince the kids of it, because if you try and tell this stuff to adults who actually think <laughs> for themselves, for the most part, they'll, they, they know that it's it's ridiculous. Right. So they do this stuff with children or students and bring them over to convince them. I believe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but if I'm. If I'm being correct, I, I think that they make every child in China when they're going through school read the art of war, right? Like that, mm -hmm. that shows the, the level of control that they have over these people. That quote that you read is just, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> that is crazy that you are convincing Americans to hate their own country and love China and their propaganda more than the country that gave them everything that they have, gave them the opportunity to even go to China to experience those kinds of things. It's wild. And there are so, so, so many examples of that. Um, another, I think, really shocking example. I like to go for shock value because I think it's good get, to convey. Get those you clicks. Know? <laughs> right. Um, but so Confucius Institutes have basically a sister group um, called Confucius Classrooms. And these are at the K through 12 level. Again, as young as four year old students being subjected to Chinese Communist Party propaganda. So we found one fourth grade classroom in Utah. Um, not only were the students there forced to be pen pals with Xi Jinping, that is the leader of the Chinese Communist Party, um, but in that same classroom, they were also airing Chinese military parades. Again, fourth graders. Um, this was all sponsored by a Confucius Institute program at a public school, so a taxpayer funded public school at that. Um, and there are many, 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 many examples of this. And I think you are very right in that TikTok has kind of made that culture war, you know, so easy, so accessible, right? It's in the palm of your hand. And we uncovered probably last year, um, but a statement that the CEO or former CEO now of TikTok had made in 2018, he had developed a bunch of apps. And one of them was actually removed from the Chinese app store um, for improper and immoral content, right? That's what they love to euphemize anything that allows for criticism mm -hmm. of the Chinese Communist exactly. Party. And he had to issue a huge apology statement uh, to the to the authorities, to the officials, you know, in hopes of frankly probably saving his life because he knew he might end up like another, you know, Chinese billionaire. Just oh no, he you know fell off a wall and died because that does happen a lot over there. Um, but in this letter. He admits that going forward, and again, this, this predates TikTok, that he would use all of his platforms and his business endeavors to, quote, promote socialist core values. And he goes on to talking about how he's going to do a better job of really weaving in the Chinese Communist Party's ambitions, agenda, agenda values, the whole thing, um, into any programs that he'd be creating going forward. 
in the next program, he creates his TikTok, you know, a platform that we know censors content that goes against the Chinese Communist Party's official narratives on a lot of issues, but is also responsible for a lot of, I would say, just domestic decay that we see going on. And, you know, there were reports that there is a lot of use of TikTok for people who are seeking to enter the United States illegally. People were trying to help illegal immigrants uh, enter across the border. They were like planning and strategizing. But there's just a lot of weird gender stuff on there. Frankly, I think there's just a lot of, you know, degeneracy. And believe me, yeah. the Chinese Communist Party is, is the biggest victor and the biggest winner when America's social structures and social values and just the institutions that we have crumble um, because it's a lot easier to exploit and take over a society um, when everyone within it hates it, just like the, you know, the quote I read from that college student or the high school student going on that trip to China. So it's it's very calculated. I guess reading Sun Tzu in an elementary school has its payoff because they really know how to wage political warfare. Yeah, exactly. No, I mean, I have been banned off TikTok. Amla was banned <laughs> off TikTok. PragerU has been banned, I believe, like five times off of TikTok. It's a badge of honor. No, seriously, I, I wear it, you know, right here. I want everyone to know. But I mean, the the CCP is paying other social media companies. I mean, they're owning parts of, of different social media companies like Snapchat and others paying millions of dollars to get their messaging across, you know, having it so that people don't actually know what's going on in China and they're influencing these people on what they censor and what they allow on their platform. But it goes even deeper than that. I mean, it goes from, from some of the reporting I've seen you do, it goes even deeper into actually the halls of our government, the lobbying, the swamp. Talk a little bit about that and how deep it really goes with the CCP in America. Yeah, so the reason that the Chinese Communist Party has been so successful, I would argue, in terms of subverting really just I mean, America as a whole, but really understanding how the American political system works um, is because they have really, really bought off a bunch of lobbyists. Um, and I'm sure people know what lobbyists are. I'm sure everyone has a very you know negative view on them, as they should. But yes. I lived in Washington, D.C. for you know a year and a half, two years. And just from living there, I think a week, you discern how influential these groups, these people are over the American political system, right? That is how things get done in D.C. It's these backroom deals. It's these K Street lobbying firms. Um, and it was really, really eye opening to me. Brief story. The Trump administration put out a list of about 20 Chinese companies that they flagged as proxies of China's military. So these were directly aiding and abetting the People's Liberation Army. Um, and of these 20 companies, four of them, so that's 20 percent, um, I had re I'd seen them before. And they were kind of obscure companies. I was like, why do I know the names of these companies? You know, I'm not a PLA collaborator. Um, and I realized as someone who reads these lobbying registrations and databases basically every day, that was where I had seen them. And I realized that, you know, Chinese military collaborators have lobbyists in Washington, D.C., that is where we are, you know, in 2022. And I started really getting into that and looking, looking into, I mean, A, how that was legal, um, but B, kind of the ramifications of that. And I started looking. And like I said, there are about a little over 250 active um, Chinese Communist Party foreign agents. So these are whether they're influence groups, companies, um, individuals who have retained U.S. based lobbyists right now. Um, in the United States, working to push the agenda, you know, of the Chinese Communist Party, um, I would say at the expense of the American taxpayer and Americans more broadly. Um, but this is really how they get to the heart of America's political system um, in the sense that whether it's, you know, various Chinese embassies, actual Chinese officials, or these kind of influence groups like the China United States Exchange Foundation, that while they are technically not a, you know, de facto or de jour branch, of the Chinese Communist Party, they effectively are. Um, and they pay these firms, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars to get secret meetings with officials in the White House, to get secret meetings in Congress. Um, and I, I, there are many, many examples. I think one of my personal favorites is because it's so outlandish. Um, so Nancy Pelosi's, and, and I think the other thing, the other really important thing to note about these lobbying firms is that you know they're staffed 
basically 100% with people whose salaries we used to pay, right? These are people who used to work in the federal government, people, whether it's the White House or Congress. So I think that to me is, you know, salt in the wound. Um, right. And a perfect example of that is, so Nancy Pelosi's former communications director, Brendan Daly, name you, you know, probably never heard of, uh, not, not that important, but after departing the Pelosi office, again, running her comms operation, he started lobbying for China Central Television, <laughs> which nice. is China's top state-run broadcaster. And it's not just that, you know, he barely did any work for them. They were going to launch in the United States anyway. So, you know, the guy just synced a contract with them. He paid him, you know, a nice kickback fee. No, no. This it was Ogilvy, public relations firm. They were actually responsible for launching CCTV's American rollout into American homes. That's China Global Television Network. And if you read the documents about what they were doing for CCTV, again, a state-run broadcaster that denies the Xinjiang genocide, that insists COVID-19 was you know, created in the United States, um, that airs force confessions, um, that it was actually a compelling and balanced source of news for American homes. And this is Nancy Pelosi's communications director. And there are many, many, many such examples. I encourage people to go to the National Pulse. You can see former Washington Post editors, people who used to work at the DNC, and believe me, people who used to work at the RNC too, have all somehow ended up on the payroll in a you know very easy to see way of a lot of these Chinese Communist Party run um, firms, but also in some cases, just the Chinese Communist Party outright. I mean, the fact that there are even TV providers in America <laughs> who would say, oh, this is fine to put on, I think shows us how backwards we are as a country, right? It shows us how sick of a society that we have. And I think you brought up an important point when you said, listen, this isn't just people on the DNC. This is the RNC as well. There are people who are bought out, no, no matter what your political party is, people who are fine selling this country to a foreign power for their own selfish gain, for their own power, their own money, uh, whatever it is. And that's a tough thing for a lot of people to come to realization to. And that's why these issues, when it comes to China, doesn't get talked about a lot because they have the, mo the money to buy out not just media, not just people on the left, but also people on the right, people in Hollywood, people in, in the university system, all of this. It, it, it is more than just, you know, little things that people have thought about China for years. This is like an all encompassing problem. No, you are you are correct. I'm not, you know, cherry picking my examples to fit a narrative. I have right. to pick examples out of, you know, the hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands that I've seen. And it, it really does permeate into every industry and just kind of aspect of American society. You know, you bring up Chinese state run. TV, because I think there is something deeper there. The fact that, you know, we see American companies that choose to defend conservative values deplatformed, you know, overnight, right? Instantly, instantaneously. Right. But all these huge television providers will still give a platform to these Chinese state run um, broadcasters, of which there are many. Um, but I also think it's interesting. Um, and like I, I think I joked, I, I always joke, I am the, uh, probably the only American and the only, you know, non-bot viewer of these programs when they air. Uh -huh. um, but I think it's important to, you know, know, know your enemy. Um, but there are actually a lot of Americans that participate on these programs too. Um, believe it or not, um, very, very senior NIH officials, that is the, you know, taxpayer funded National Institutes of Health, yeah. um, which Anthony Fauci leads the uh, infectious now, uh, infectious diseases and allergies branch of um, who actually participate quite frequently in interviews with CGTN. They actually produced a documentary on the origins of COVID-19 not too long ago. I'm sure I that mean, was I just full was, of information and just all the oh, right answers, right? Oh, definitely. You know, they, they blamed everything from, from frozen food to, you know, Americans to, you know, probably Prager you for starting COVID-19. No, seriously, this show started COVID-19. Uh, I yeah, they, couldn't stop they eating pangolins. <laughs> but um, they used, I believe it was the director of like emergency medicine at the NIH. I think that that was his position. Um, but he was one of the star interviewees in this documentary. So that's taxpayer funded NIH officials starring in Chinese propaganda documentaries about the origins of COVID. And there've been a lot, a lot of researchers 
who um, have received a lot, a lot of money from Anthony Fauci, I'm talking millions of dollars, who go on um, Chinese state-run media and praise Beijing's response to COVID-19, which is just absolutely insane um, at face value. And interestingly enough, kind of the similar level of I mean, it's, it really is misinformation. I hate how the left has ruined that word. Um, but a lot of the, the experts, so-called experts, that um, the American media would cite to debunk, you know, the lab leak theory. Um, well, they also had a lot of ties to the Chinese Communist Party. One of my, my favorites, there was an individual named Deborah Seligson, who not only was a star in Chinese state-run media, she had been on CGTN a bunch, um, but she actually, in the 90s, went over to China and lectured at the, the Central Party School. So she was lecturing Chinese Communist Party officials, and she wrote a bunch of op-eds. She was quoted in every mainstream media outlet as one of the top deniers of the lab leak theory. Um, there were other people, um, such as like Dr. Ian Lipkin, who, if you read his resume, he describes himself as a consultant for the Chinese Communist Party. And he was, again, one of these top voices that American media outlets amplified um, to deny and discredit the lab leak. Um, and there are many, many, many examples of this, many, too, too many to list. Um, and this is just kind of the example of the subversive kind of under the radar way that these media outlets will push an agenda uh, without really even telling you and never disclosing, you know, where the individuals they're quoting, you know, get their money from while in the same breath screaming foreign collusion when it comes to Donald Trump. I think all this information, you're going to get me banned off YouTube, Natalie, <laughs> <You're> <laughs> which, welcome. which is fine. You know, this is, this, this is the fight that <laughs> these, there are hills now in America that I think that we as, as people who love freedom and who love truth, there are hills to die on. Right. I think when it comes to the stuff with the covid pandemic, I think that that's something to die on. I think when it comes to all this with China and the control that they have over us, it's something to die on when you're seeing what's happening. I mean, I am looking at what's happening with the CCP and I say boldly, I will never let the CCP have dominion over me. Not now, not ever any control over my life to the best of my ability that I can. I hope that the people in America say the same thing. What is the solution for getting outside of their of their realm of control? Yes. Well, that is the very, very difficult million, if not billion dollar question, because it is so hard because right. really every institution in the United States that has power, even the Republican Party, is pretty OK with the way things are. And it's pretty OK with the control of the Chinese Communist Party. It's a very you know, nice, corrupt bargain between our elites um, and, and the Chinese. But I think just the fact that, you know, hopefully you've listened to this interview and there are many, many. Well, not, not many, many. There, I would say maybe just one. There are many others, um, like myself, who do pay due diligence to this issue. So listen to them. They're much smarter than I am. Um, but I think in informing yourself and just knowing that, you know, it's not just the origins of COVID-19 that the Chinese Communist Party has attempted to cover up. It is a decades-long assault on American liberties, on American culture. It is a decades-long calculated incursion into every single corner of American society, from your kindergarten classroom to your college professor um, to even, you know, the pharmaceutical, you know, meds that you have to take. You know, those have all been outsourced to China, too, for manufacturing, because believe me, a lot of those people who did that are getting a lot of kickbacks now, although now we're learning the the you know, hard shortcomings of doing that. Um, but I think just understanding that every single corner, um, which I think people know that this country, this great country that we live in is really a battlefield for the Chinese Communist Party. So I think it's just being diligent and, you know, share, sharing these stories are, are really, really important. But, you know, I think just, you know, they love to say herd immunity and that's you no know, H-E-R-D immunity. But I think my thing is herd H-E-A-R-D immunity, right, when it comes to hearing these stories, because if you listen and you read these stories and you know what the Chinese Communist Party, with all their Wall Street buddies and what they're trying to do, not just with COVID-19, but just in general, um, it won't it won't work on you. Um, and I think the more people that we can get kind of understanding this, um, believe me, when I talk to most people my age about this, they look at me, their eyes gloss over and they yeah. say, you are crazy. <laughs> I know. But I think, if, right, I know. So if we could get more people <laughs> to understand the really the gravity um you know it's 
it's it's worth deleting TikTok. It's worth not going on TikTok. It's worth not seeing a stupid short minute video uh, if it means you know saving the United States. Um, so I think just framing it in terms of risk rewards that people can understand. But I I yet I've yet to come up with with the solution to it because if right. I did I would have enacted it a while ago. <laughs> yeah, of course. No, we can't expect you to be the president yet, but soon enough. You know. <laughs> who, who knows? I, I, I'll have you help me with this. What I'm trying to do as okay. my kind of final goodbye on TikTok, I want to make a video and I want the <laughs> video to get banned. I want the video to get me banned. So if you have any good ideas for a video that will definitely get me banned by the CCP, I, I would love to hear it. Well, you could just collab with the National Pulse and I think you could post uh-huh. a clip of this interview and you might be good. Oh, good. Um, Easy you know, enough. I think, I, think, I think you should uh, do a TikTok with my wonderful boss, um, who's done a Prager you video, Raheem mm-hmm. Kassam. Um, I think he is uh, someone who they really don't like. Or even better, Steve Bannon is sanctioned by the Chinese Communist Party. So maybe you could do Hero. an awesome video. And so is Peter Navarro, yeah. another good friend of War Room. So maybe uh-huh. you could do a video highlighting everyone who's been sanctioned by the Chinese Communist Party. I, I know we all do. Uh, we do one of those videos like the nurse is dancing. Yeah, you know, but there we go. With Steve Bannon, I, I'm sure people, if Steve Bannon does a TikTok dance, I'm sure they'll keep it up. There's no way people no. cannot see that, right? I'm hoping uh, <laughs> next week I'm going to be in D.C. Uh, for the Defeat the Mandates D.C. rally with okay. uh, Robert Malone, Dr. McCullough, a lot of uh, Robert K- Kennedy Jr. So hoping to go on War Room when I'm there next Saturday for the 5 p.m. show. We'll see if, if we can do it and then we'll. We'll yes, try and get the try and get the the TikTok with Steve and see if we can get banned. <laughs> <laughs> see what we can do. But now it. this this could have been a you know I had more questions here that I had down. This could be a three hour long Joe Rogan podcast, but sadly the show only goes for an hour. So tell people about you know how they can find out more about you, find out more information about all of this as well, and and what their call to action should be. Sure. So you can find me as much as I just railed against big tech and Chinese Communist Party uh-huh. collaborators. You can find me on one of the worst platforms, Twitter, at Natalie G. Winters. That's where I share, although I'm sure very shadow banned, um, most of my articles. Um, I also share my stuff on Facebook. Um, and uh, Raheem and I do have a podcast, it's The National Pulse. Uh, you can go to thenationalpulse.com slash support us to help us out. And um, I'm also on Getter at Natalie G. Winters, but I think your best bet is probably Twitter, which again is Natalie G. Winters. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone getting on Getter. It's uh, <laughs> it's the future, right? As, as they would say in the war room, it's amazing. So Natalie, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on. Appreciate thank it. You. And uh, I really hope people take what you said and what we discussed today to heart. It really is important. And it's, it's one of the biggest fights of our time and people got to start waking up and paying attention to it. And when you see the truth, when you see things like this happening, you don't say, Oh, this is for someone else to worry about. This is for the quote unquote experts to talk about and worry about. You say, no, I know the truth. I know the information. And maybe even if people don't like me for saying this truth or information, you're going to get it out there anyway. You're going to share the articles with the truth about the CCP. You're going to share episodes like this. You're going to do things to get real information out there because you will not kowtow to what the CCP or the left or any of these people wanting to control you want you to do. It's time for us all to be brave and be those strong people. If you guys enjoyed this show, make sure that you like this video, comment your thoughts down below, share this with your friends. You can always always find us on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Play, rate us five stars on there. Let us know that you're enjoying the show. Let people know that, you know, you prefer the uh, the episodes with just Amala over the episodes that just have me. And that's about it, guys. We're going to see you next week on Monday for some new episodes. Thanks, guys, for watching.